Good afternoon, everyone. In honor of Miami's 125th anniversary, we are going live today to talk about why preserving historic landmarks is so important and how this work impacts our community. We're going to start today by talking about the difference between preservation and conservation with the Skyhawk conservator, Kelly. So I will go ahead and turn it over to her. Hi, everybody. So uh, we're going to be talking a lot about historic preservation and conservation today. And so I just wanted to start out a little bit um, with some basic examples of what we mean when we say that. So uh, for historic preservation, when we're talking about that, we're talking about identifying, protecting and enhancing buildings, places and objects of historic and cultural significance. Um, and here we have a picture of the tea house here at Vizcaya um, to give you an idea of, of the types of structures that that would entail. Um, now for conservation, we can go to the next slide. For conservation, it's a little um, uh, more a specific of a field it's a little more um, narrow we'll say and um, that is the process through which the material historic um, design integrity of cultural property is prolonged through the carefully planned interventions and care so conservation is is sort of the one of the ways in which things can be preserved um, uh, there's also restoration and rehabilitation, but for the purposes of this conversation, we're just kind of just focusing on uh, preservation and conservation. And so the goal here is to retain as much original material as possible. Um, and so I will pass it off to Chris, who will um, tell us about Deed Heritage Trust, and um, we'll be talking about uh, preservation and conservation with you today. Uh, great. Uh, hi, everybody, and, and thanks so much, Kelly, for the intro. Uh, for those of you that might not be familiar with Dade Heritage Trust, as you can see on the screen, we were founded in 1972, back when Miami-Dade County was simply Dade County. Um, we focus on historic preservation, and our mission is to preserve Miami-Dade County's architectural, cultural, and environmental heritage through education and advocacy. That's our lovely little headquarters building where I'm at today in one of our gallery spaces. We're in the original office of Miami's first physician, Dr. James Jackson. This lovely building was built in 1905 and we reside here in the Brickle area surrounded by high rises. So we're a great example of our mission um, by, take, by having and maintaining this lovely historic building for community use. We're open every day of the week as a visitor center and a gallery space, um, which helps us, us introduce our mission to residents of Miami and, and tourists as well. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, one of the things that Dade Heritage Trust has recently uh, gotten into is affordable housing. As the executive director, I'm trying to really position Dade Heritage Trust as an organization that can help solve Miami's problems. And of course, affordability is one of them. Through a, a beautiful grant from Miami-Dade County, we were able to purchase this lovely four unit Art Deco building in Little Havana to preserve the building and preserve um, the affordable housing. And part of what Kelly said, the whole conservation aspect of, of preserving this building came into play. Um, we actually worked with um, a firm, RLA, which is, uh, has offices here in Miami and LA. Kelly's very familiar with them. Um, Alex, I think we, so here you have a, an example of conservation at work on our building. Uh, as this is a 1938 Art Deco structure, there were these beautiful um, embellishments known as frozen fountains uh, in the stucco. And unfortunately, a couple of them had been covered up uh, plastered and painted over. And so we called upon this great conservation team to help replicate those original details, which are now uh, lovely and fully replicated on, on the building. You even have a couple of them there in the photo. We do. The yeah. RLA team. <laughs> <laughs> the RLA team uh, at work. And something else that um, RLA helped us work on was um, 
a survey uh, and conservation recommendations at the historic Miami City Cemetery. There on, on the left, you see this cute little Cub Scout there for a cleaning day, um, using the proper materials, of course, um, of course, looking on a marker at the Miami City Cemetery. And Kelly, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about, about those efforts since you were- Yeah, this is actually a great example of um, sort of where preservation and conservation work in concert together. Um, this was a survey, headstone by headstone survey that um, we did for Dade Heritage Trust. Um, and with the survey, what we were able to do is essentially highlight any areas of concern throughout the cemetery and make recommendations for how things should be cared for in the future. And it really allowed Dave Heritage Trust to have a baseline level of information for what they have in the cemetery because um, before that, it, it wasn't really clear what the needs were. So this will allow them to sort of move forward um, knowing what they have. And, you know, unfortunately, as the way the world works, sometimes if you can't get to things for a while, they'll have information on, on the conditions uh, and how they've deteriorated over time. So. Yeah. This is also a great example of our efforts through education and advocacy. The historic city cemetery is owned by the city of Miami. So Dade Heritage Trust paid for these survey services and it shows the city that we're willing to work with them and actually um, you know, extend our expertise uh, to the city for, for their use as well. And it provides great education for visitors um, who, who wanna learn more. Uh, you know about the history of the cemetery it's it's an amazing venue there was a lot of again engagement with the community while this project was going on there were lots of people who passed through the cemetery and wanted to know what was going on and had an interest in the cemetery so absolutely yeah great i would tell them a really bad joke but i won't do it <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh this this soon to be lovely building uh, is a great example of historic preservation and, and restoration of a building. Um, there's a bit of conservation to do here, obviously as well. Um, being an historic preservation organization, we can always see the beauty in these older buildings and, and look at the potential. This is a, a structure that was deemed historic several years ago. Um, it's in the Lummis Park Historic District, which is on the Miami River, just north of downtown. And this building was constructed in 1917 and left to fall into severe disrepair, as you can see on the image of the left, on the left. We gained title, Dade Heritage Trust gained title um, to this building and we're in the very, very beginning processes of restoration and we're gonna open it up to the community um, as a, a community center event and education space. Um, because it's, it represents one of the older and, and lovely wood frame structures of, of that era. And let's face it, there, there aren't too many of those you know, left in urban Miami. Um, the next slide, Alex, is a, again, another picture of Dade Heritage Trust and, and what we do. Um, out of our little historic building, we've found that it's really, it's been great to reach out to the community and we have wonderful neighbors in the Brickell area. And of course, a lot of visitors uh, we're recognized as an official visitor center for the city of Miami. We have, um, we'll start up again. They were postponed due to COVID of course, but we'll start up again with our walking tour, our bike tour program uh, and, and welcoming people to learn um, about, about the importance of, of preserving these historic buildings and the stories they tell. Obviously nothing as grand as what you work on every day, Kelly uh, Vizcaya, but all of these lovely historic buildings have stories to tell and they symbolize our history. Um, something it's that's all I, important. Very important. It's yeah. something that I always like to say is that, you know, um, I'm not from Miami. I know Lucia was born and raised in Miami. Kelly, are you a, a native? No. So most, for the most part, Miami is made up of people that are from somewhere else. So, and so home means different things. And what these historic buildings do is help develop a shared sense of history in our community. So regardless of where we're all from, we can pay respect to and, and learn about these historic structures that 
tell the stories of where we live now and in our home, Miami. Well, and I always think, I mean, you know, we're really fortunate here at Vizcaya. Our mission is preservation of the of the building, among other things. But, you know, you guys really advocate for a lot of buildings. And, and that's what's really exciting about Dade Heritage Trust is, is that, you know, you guys have such an impact uh, throughout the community. Thank you. Uh, and we're really focusing on, uh, as an organization, the, the need for preservation uh, in neighborhoods of color. You know, a lot of times preservation and, and pre preserving these historic sites and improving them um, comes from, from people who feel empowered, right? Uh, residents that say, I, I, want, I want to take action in my neighborhood to, to ensure that these places that, that um, that create this shared sense of history are preserved. And that has been severely lacking in neighborhoods of color, not just in Miami-Dade County, but throughout the country. And I want, I want to uh, let you guys know about this great building. This is a building in the Brownsville neighborhood, which is an unincorporated Miami-Dade County, um, a traditionally African-American neighborhood. And this is a building called Georgette's Tea Room. Back in the uh, 50s and 60s, um, African-American entertainers um, you know, were, were quite plentiful over on Miami Beach, but due to segregation, they could not stay on the beach. And so there were um, Green Book hotels here in Miami and this bed and breakfast, which, um, which served those African-American entertainers. And the next slide actually shows a great image of, of Billie Holiday, a well-known singer, uh, entertaining a group of guests at, at, at Georgia's Tea Room. And we are working with the current owners of this tea room to ensure that that building is uh, is being restored, respected, and again that that story and these stories of segregation are appropriately told, um, because I don't think they're really that well known in Miami. So, good news: the building is getting a new roof as we speak. Um, another. Uh, really interesting building um, and you can see here again it, it has potential this little building is in overtown and it was known as the x-ray clinic up until um, the early 1960s this was one of the only places where african americans could actually go for radiation services in the entirety of the city um, recently it was purchased um, by an organization called the black archives which does a fabulous job of detailing African-American heritage um, in Miami-Dade County. And they're going to rehabilitate it through a grant from the Overtown CRA and create a, a community space to, again, help, help keep these stories alive. They're very important. Dade Heritage Trust um, is making inroads, again, working in partnership um, when, in these neighborhoods, and we helped historically designate this lovely church in Overtown. This is St. Um, St. Peter's Church. And it was um, on the unsafe structure list in the city of Miami. And the owners came to us looking for help. We helped broker a grant again with the Overtown CRA uh, who paid for the restoration of this church. And we're currently working with the owners on, a, on an adaptive reuse plan. It's just, beautiful inside um, and and a real um, a real staple of the neighborhood there since 1935. Something that uh, Dade Heritage Trust has also been involved in and Lucia, our school programs manager, is, has become our tree expert. I have to say, I, I can't, she's always telling me about her expertise on trees and, and informing and educating me. But, you know, because part of our um, mission is environmental heritage and you know kelly when you look at the gardens at Vizcaya and the, and and the the tree canopy that you guys offer it's part and parcel of what makes your venue so great absolutely um, i mean i remember when i first moved to miami in 93 you know i thought oh my god i can walk down streets and there's avocados and mangoes and carambola i'm like this is crazy in urban miami and our, our trees are so important and understanding that how Miami is evolving over the course of the last 10 years, a lot of tree canopy has been lost. And so um, advocates came to Dade Heritage Trust uh, saying, what can we do? So we created an initiative called the Miami Canopy Coalition. 
And right now we're working with um, various partners to produce a white paper, which we're going to promote to our, um, to our elected officials to see how we can make a difference in preserving these urban trees. Um, not everybody respects trees. And here's a great photograph, a couple of great photographs. Um, the, these are construction sites in Brickell. And I'm sorry to say both of these trees are now, are now gone. And they, there was really no reason for them to be lost, but it's, it's why this cannot be coalition is, and the work is so vitally important. Uh, as I mentioned before, part of what we do is, is education. I mean, you can't expect people to pay attention to preservation and conservation unless they actually know these venues exist. And it's hard to imagine. I'm sure there's a lot of people that live in Miami that have never been to Vizcaya. Uh, and what, 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 is proven to us um, and Lucia in her education program is that um, we do tours, uh, we do monthly bike tours. We'll start them up again in October, but the we visit great venues. This is the the uh, river in Miami um, along uh, North River Drive. But uh, most participants that join our bike tours, we take them to places they didn't even know exist, regardless of how long they've lived in Miami. So again. Education and outreach is, is really key to the success of, of historic preservation in Miami. And it's it's a pleasure to be on a ride with 40, 50 people that say, you know, I've lived here for 20 years and I never knew about this place. How is that possible? So um, we love the tours. And um, Lucia isn't just our school programs manager. Um, she's also a great baker. And gosh, I get to take advantage of that. Uh, <laughs> she's bringing in something delicious. So, uh, again, a, a way to engage people in learning about historic places, we created a program with Lucia's expertise called Baking in Historic Places. This is a, um, oh, that's my phone ringing. I'm sorry, I didn't turn it off. Um, so, this this um, is one of my favorite uh, events that you guys do. Um, yeah, you participated. I've, I've participated many times uh, before COVID, but I, yeah, I've participated yeah. many times. It's one of my favorites. So we're going to bring back baking in historic places. Uh, we go to a venue quarterly that has a kitchen. This is a, 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 a photograph of our um, baking taking place at the Campong, beautiful venue in Coconut Grove with Lucia leading the workshop there. It's open to families. Uh, we create, we bring in all the supplies and we create a baked good that, that really is tied to the venue itself. And it's always delicious. Yeah. <laughs> like, what have, what have we, what have we like, think about the venues and tie that to what we've baked? What have we made? Yeah. Well, we made bread at the Scottish Rite Temple and I didn't really have a connection to that one. I just wanted to make bread. <laughs> they had such a big table that was perfect for it. Right. Um, at the Kampong, we made banana bread and we used bananas that grew there at the Kampong. I remember we asked them to freeze a bunch of bananas for us. Um, at uh, that botanical garden, Montgomery, we made scones inspired by... Um, the woman, her name, what's her name? Nell, Nell Montgomery. Nell Montgomery's love for tea. I missed that one and I was very sad because I wanted to make scones. <laughs> but my favorite one, and I think Chris will agree, was the one we did at Fruit and Spice Park because there was just so much fruit to play with and um, we made these really good galettes. Kelly, did you go to that one? I was at that one, yeah. Okay. Was great. Yeah, that was great. And I still make galettes all the time, actually, because they're so much easier than yeah, pies. Exactly. Yeah, face pie. What's not to love about that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, again, a, a great way to engage people because at the end of the day, um, you know, we do all this. Kelly, her great conservation work, Lucia, her great education work. And then what we do here at Dade Heritage Trust through preservation is really oh. about people and engaging people to learn about where they live, take pride, it's about civic engagement. And, um, you know, again, creating this shared heritage can, can bring us all together and, um, and really create, great, um, great, a great sense of community. So that's what we're all about. 
That's great. Well, and I now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, yeah. Kelly. Yes. The Thanks, Fiscaya Chris. Conservator. Fiscaya Conservator, yes. So for those of you who might not know, Fiscaya is, uh, was built uh, between 1914 and 1922 to be the winter residence for um, industrial, industrialist James Deering. And it was intended to be a modern and subtropical interpretation of an 18th century Italian villa. And so we have um, the main house and then also all of our gardens, as Chris mentioned earlier. And uh, we actually have the village across the street, which is not yet open to the public, but is in our future plan. Um, and so we have a great uh, deal of history to preserve here, um, focused on uh, you know what we have here on the property, which is great. Um, I have been with this guy only three months. And before that, as Chris mentioned, I was with a conservation firm based here in Miami, RLA Conservation. And before that, I actually worked in Philadelphia for a different conservation firm. And um, conservation is an interesting field. It's a multidisciplinary field uh, that requires additional training. And one of the things that really drew me to the field in general was how variable it was, how different every day is. And, um, you know, we do a wide range of things, like we mentioned with the cemetery, you know, surveying or doing condition assessments um, to actually doing the hands-on work, uh, cleaning and making repairs and, and putting things back together. And so, you never really know what you're going to do from day to day. And that's one of the things that I really find exciting about it. You get to um, go a lot of places that not everyone gets to go and see a lot of things that not everyone gets to see. Um, and that always really appealed to me. Uh, so because it's such a variable field, you collaborate with a lot of different um, uh specialties, so architects, engineers, contractors, and of course, advocacy uh, groups like Dade Heritage Trust. And it's really nice because you get to sort of see all sides of what you're doing and you really get to experience um, history from the material culture. And that's what I really enjoy about it because I've always been a bit of a history net both art history and just general history. And, and you get to experience history through the physical world, which I really appreciate. Um, and so these are just some photos of me at work. Um, but if you could go to the next slide, um, I thought we'd start off with a couple different projects. And this is actually more photos of the cemetery, which um, we already talked about, but there's a lot of really great monuments in there. Um, I um, love the I love the ones that are just handwritten. The yeah. hand carved. I I fabulous. I picked this photo in specifically because of that. I mean, it's something that's really unique and you don't always see. Um, and to me, there's so much care and love in that headstone because you know it, it's hand carved um, concrete and you know I just I love it it, it speaks to the situation and, and it speaks to my soul <laughs> I find interesting though she's simply Mrs. Robert C. Davis she doesn't have a there's no first name you know the, yeah the wife yeah wife what year is it 1943 uh, yeah, yeah. That, you see that a lot, though. I mean, I've done a lot of cemetery surveys, and you see that a lot, it, uh, which is always kind of sad to me. But I guess that was the time. <laughs> I mean, I want I want my name on mine. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I was going to talk about a couple different projects you know, throughout Miami that I got to work on with RLA prior to coming to Vizcaya, just so that you have an idea of, of what it is um, conservation does and, and what it does for the community. So uh, some people will be familiar with the Miami Marine Stadium. Uh, if you're not, it's a great building 
out on Virginia Key. Um, and uh, if you happen to know the architect, you can write in and say, uh, um, but he's great and he's a Miami-based architect. Um, and this is an exposed concrete building and it's built for boat races initially. And about half of its life was uh, devoted to this purpose. And then in 1992, when Andrew came through, it was actually closed. And so the second half of its life, uh, it functioned as a as a gathering place um, for artists. And and it has street art and graffiti covering most of the the lower surfaces of it at some points up to 200 layers of graffiti. So it's a really um, unique structure, but it's also a really unique conservation problem because it's not, usually it doesn't get to that point. Um, and so I was fortunate enough with RLA to, to participate in two different campaigns on uh, trying to determine how this building could be saved and returned to its original aesthetic and that the original material could be retained and the original finish could be retained um, because as it's supposed to concrete, it um, has a specific look to it. And so um, this was uh, testing campaigns and, and hopefully those testing campaigns will uh, inform the actual work to take place sometime in the near future. Yeah, as you know, I mean, the Miami Marine Stadium is, is something that's been on uh, Data Heritage Trust project for oh. yeah well over a decade, probably going on 20 years now, lobbying um, and advocating for the preservation of this amazing structure. There's no other place like it. Uh, and it deserves preservation. You know, it's one of the few buildings in Miami that was found to be so, so significant architecturally and culturally that it didn't have to meet that 50 year um, requirement to be historically designated. It, it, it is designated both on a local and a federal level, and it deserves um, it deserves full restoration. Kelly, my question to you though about the Marine Stadium, we get this a lot. So since you're the expert when it comes to conservation, I mean, uh, you know, for people for the last what 20 years, it's just been home to street art. Is there any way to properly restore and conserve that building and yet maintain? any of that street art identity or does it all have to go away? <laughs> so that's a major question. And that's like a live stream all in its own. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's essentially what our, the two campaigns that I did with RLA, um, you know, Rosa Lowinger, my, my boss at RLA um, is, is very uh, integrated into that conversation along with um, Heisen Bottle Architects, who's, who is the architect on the project right now. And um, the initial phase of testing that we did was uh, with the Getty Keeping It Modern initiative. And, um, you know, we were able to determine that the graffiti could be removed and that the original wall could um, surface could be retained. And there was an outreach um, charrette done at that time uh, with some of the street art community to figure out sort of what um, they would be comfortable with as far as, you know, preservation of the graffiti and, and saving it. And I, I mean, I think a lot of that conversation is still, excuse me, ongoing. Um, but bottom line is there are certain things that, that have to be removed in order to fix things that have are, are wrong with the building structurally. Um, so any of the graffiti on the large expanses of wall, which is where a lot of the murals were, um, that would need to be removed for restoration purposes. So I, I think um, all of it can't, stay just to, to keep the building standing. Um, and so I think the question then becomes like, do you save parts of it or, um, and I think a lot of the street art community was against picking and choosing what you save and what you remove. But I, I am no longer part of that project. <laughs> so I just want to be really clear. I am not speaking for the project. Well, as long as you save my piece, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, okay, so this is uh, the Miami Beach Community Church uh, on Miami Beach, and it's right on Lincoln Road. And this is a great project and a good example of collaboration uh, with a contractor. So the contractor was doing a full re rehabilitation of, of the building, um, and I should have included a before photo, but if you'd seen it before, it didn't look anything like this, but this is the original aesthetic. Um, and we were brought in to help with this decorative uh, frontispiece, this, this center decorative piece on the facade. And um, we stabilized a lot of the original material. Um, we had to replace some of the old rebar and, um, you know, uh, patch areas of loss and um, put it back to its original aesthetic. And so this is a nice collaboration where you can have conservation on uh, on the team so that it, oh, there's a great, excellent, there, there's a picture wow. of it before. Yeah, so um, you can really see the difference. And it was painted white at some point and Originally, it had a tinted stucco, um, which is that brown that, that you were seeing in the after photo. Um, and it, this was such a great transformation. It was such an amazing project. And I, I believe it even won some awards, um, some preservation awards. So, um, but it's a great uh, uh, collaboration between RLA Conservation and Red Door Construction. Um, and the architect and all of the team members involved because uh, the preservation of this building was really important to bring it back to its original aesthetic, which is really exciting. And, and it really um, is a gem right there on Lincoln Road. So. Okay, so now we'll talk about some work that we have going on here at Vizcaya. Um, so some of you might know that uh, we've had a lot of work going on to our waterfront structures. Um, Hurricane Irma really did some damage uh, in 2017 and left uh, the boat landing almost completely destroyed. And the barge uh, you can see in this, in this video that's showing um, the balustrades on the east side, there's only two of the six that, are, that were standing. Um, one of the urns was toppled. toppled. Uh, one of the obelisks was broken in half. Um, and so this is, is work that we're getting to fix now. And uh, that, that little circle there is showing where the, the urn was missing. And now you can see from these images that we're getting to put it all back. And it's, it's really looking exciting. And if anyone's been out to the sky and you've seen that little floating bridge out to the barge, that's what we're doing out there. That's, that's getting us back and forth so that we can get the, the barge back to uh, its, its stable situation. And the barge um, functions as a breakwater for Vizcaya. So it's really important that it be whole and um, it's a really exciting project. It's something that I always wanted to work on when I first moved to Miami seven years ago. So your dreams came true. My dreams came true. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is the, the boat landing and the bridge to the boat landing. As I mentioned, Hurricane Irma um, really did some damage. It, it unseated a lot of the pavers on the boat landing and toppled them and threw a lot into the water um, and broke off balusters and, and you know displaced whole walls. And so we had to work with a, the contractor, had to work with a floating barge crane um, to, to, you know, this photo is showing them salvaging some of the pieces from the water, which happened um, shortly after the storm. Uh, and all of those pieces were collected and, and um, put back together. And, and we utilized historic photos and uh, historic drawings to create the pattern for the boat landing and um, put it all back together like a big, giant, heavy jigsaw puzzle. 
Um, but while we were doing that, we also made some improvements to the interior um, structure, uh, which because it, it really didn't have much uh, structure uh, in there. There were tensioner rods, which you can see um, in this photo here, but they put in a geotextile liner that will help to keep some of the water out and that will keep everything in place. And they also, excuse me, put in a, um, a this is some uh, rebar that they put in and then they put a concrete pad over top of that and you can see them moving the, the concrete around in this photo. Um, and that's really gonna strengthen the boat landing and uh, you know prepare us for future weather events because uh, we are right on the water. So we have to think about these things as well when we're doing preservation. It's not just putting it back exactly how it was. We have to try to think about how we can make it last for many years to come and make it look like it did originally. <laughs> Um, the swimming pool grotto is another big project that um, we have here at Vizcaya. My predecessor, Lauren Hall, did a lot of um, research and analysis, and there's been a lot of conservators um, to come and, and do research on this. It's a really fantastic space. Um, it's a really unique space, and it has a lot of challenges associated with it. Um, it uh, is something that I was going to ask if you know who the artist was, but it's right there on the slide. So <laughs> um, well, Robert Winslow Chandler uh, painted this ceiling and a lot of his work um, has been painted over or, or lost over the years. And so it's really important piece um, for the artist, not just for Vizcaya as well. And so um, we have a lot of, of challenges for this painted ceiling on plaster over a swimming pool about 80 feet from the water. Yeah, you don't <laughs> so. need any of your challenges. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is something that we'll be working on uh, in the coming months Did he and also years. do the, the shell mosaics? Or was that, like, this is just fabulous. How... Yeah, so so a lot all of this three dimensional work on the ceiling was done by him. Yeah, so um, you can see all the different creatures in there, and it's really beautiful. I mean, there are metallic uh, paints and and leaf up there. Um, not paints, leaf. There's metallic leaf and then paint uh, that's up there. It it would have been stunning originally, and so um, you know. It's, it's a very, as, as Helen says, it's a very vulnerable space to rising water and storms, but also just from what we in the industry say is inherent vice, meaning that the materials that were used uh, were maybe not the best for that particular location. And so it, it has natural deterioration that, that comes from that. And so, um, you know, as a conservator, it's you struggle with, OK, well, how how do we deal with this now? Because we want to save what was there originally. And so um, it's there's a it's a really interesting and and fun conservation challenge. And I'm sure if you follow uh, the sky, you'll be hearing more about this uh, in the coming months and years. So, um, was that the last slide? Oh no, okay, it's one more. <laughs> um, so we have been talking about all of these major projects that we have going on here at Vizcaya, but um, that's not to forget about the smaller projects that we have as well. Um, these three are all projects that I, again, did, uh, uh, when I worked with RLA uh, prior to coming to work for Vizcaya here. Um, but the on the left is the candelabrum that's in the living room. Um, and then the uh, two lanterns are on the different elevations of the house. And these were all conservation projects that took place. Um, and one of the things I like to point out about the lanterns is um, 
part of this conservation project was also figuring out how to store them during storm prep, because that is something that we always have to think about here in Miami, um, whether you're at the Skya or anywhere else, um, you know, it's, you have to account for what you do in case of a storm. And so these had special crates built for them and they actually lift out of their brackets and, and go into storm crates uh, when hurricane season comes. So if you come tomorrow, these won't be hanging on the wall because we're technically in hurricane season. So, you know, um, Katie, but it, I, I think it would be so cool. I mean, you know, when you go to Vizcaya, first of all, for me, it's like, I always have to keep in mind, somebody called this home, which is amazing. Yeah. But the, it, I mean, there's so much, there's so much to take in that sometimes, you know, the, the small details are lost in the bigger picture. But I think it would be so cool to present a conservation tour, like of, of your work be, and the degree of, of the ongoing conservation there, I think is something that probably people take for granted, right? But to keep the sky looking like it does, um, just from what you've told us today is when I think about the entirety of it, it's it's pretty mind blowing. Um, yeah, expertise to keep it looking as beautiful as it is. Yeah, we have a lot of, of unique challenges here um, from a materials standpoint, but also from an environmental standpoint. Um, yeah, it's it's fun. It's never, never a dull moment around here. <laughs> <laughs> Great work. So I think now uh, I will pass it off to Lucia. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Kelly. Um, my name is Lucia. I'm the school programs manager for Dade Heritage Trust. And I've been here now since 2017. But fun fact, I used to work at Vizcaya. As an oh, I educator. didn't know that. Yeah. So I remember, you know, I was always jealous of the conservation staff because they would always be inside the rooms, you know, and in, in places that the rest of us really couldn't go to. So, and they'd I always say, be like listening to music and just vacuuming. And just I always <laughs> say I went into conservation so I could go behind the ropes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, I came on in 2017. And like Chris was saying, you know, in addition to advocacy work, um, education and community engagement are essential to our work in historic preservation. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our different offerings and how we engage students in many different ways with the subject of preservation. I don't go into the detail, you know, that, that Kelly does in her work. Um, that's a lot more specialized. But basically, Historic Places Green Spaces um, is an education program for K through 12 students that is designed to acquaint students with different historic places and recreational places in Miami in the hopes of inspiring them to not only visit more historic sites, you know, like Vizcaya and others in Miami, but also become advocates for preserving um, historic structures and, and green spaces in Miami. So it's, you know, it's a great way to engage students outside of the classroom, in particular elementary school students, you know, they're learning a lot about life in the past and Florida history. So getting to be on site and, and actually um, see these places in person is really meaningful and fun for them. So the first one that I'm gonna talk about, so these are two historic buildings located in Lummis Park. This is the city of Miami's Lummis Park uh, near downtown. And it's home to two buildings. So the first one is that Longhouse building, the long one. That one is known as the Fort Dallas Longhouse. And it was built in 1844 initially as a house for enslaved workers of a plantation that was located on the 
north bank of the of the Miami River. And the other building where you see the kids sitting on the porch, that one is the William Wagner Homestead, which was built in 1855 by one of Miami's earliest known pioneers, William Wagner. And both of those buildings were, were moved to that park in order to, to preserve them. And we received, you know, with grant funding, we were able to hire a curator and a graphic design team to interpret the interior of the buildings and provide like museum quality signage inside because before that, um, these buildings are just closed to the public. And actually they are still closed to the public. They only open when we um, program there. And I believe History Miami also programs there occasionally with Dr. Paul George. But um, yeah, uh, we've been taking kids there and it's been, it's been really great. The next slide kind of shows you a sample work that they did. So I think that um, one of the unique things about our education program, we don't just focus on the history of the building who lived here and whatnot. We also discuss the building's um, preservation history. So we talk about how this building was gonna be demolished or it was moved here in order to preserve and protect it. So this is um, one, of my, one of my favorite student works of this year. Uh, at the Fort Dallas Longhouse building, we have an activity for middle school students where um, we have them pretend it's 1925, which was when the building was going to be um, demolished. And they have to pick a side to preserve or, or demolish. So um, That's that really was cute. To preserve, but That's I, really cute. The things that people, the kids come up with, and I show Chris all the time, I'll send her um, pictures of the crazy things that kids draw. My favorite is the little guy in the corner with the hammer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so cute. And I mean, he wrote, history is to be remembered forever. Don't destroy, but do preserve. I thought it was really sweet. Um, so this other, this picture is um, me with a group of students at, um, at Simpson Park. So again, the program is called Historic Places, Green Spaces. So every program has a little bit of that. Some have a little bit more of the historic, some have more of the green space. This one is definitely a little bit more green space, but it does have um, history. So, you know, it's a lush tropical hardwood hammock located in Brickell of all places. It's this little, dense um, forest. And we partnered with the city of Miami um, to restore some of the old signage that they had along the trail that had deteriorated over the years. And we also provided new interpretive signage about the history of who Charles Simpson was, why the park was named after him to begin with. And, you know, this park was designated an old growth forest some years ago. And, you know, with students, we we get to walk along the trail. A lot of these students have never been to a park like this before. Um, and, and what I like about this park is that students can really see firsthand the differences between um, the natural areas versus like the man-made buildings. Like you can see the buildings sort of in the back behind the, the forest and you can hear the train passing by. Um, so one of my favorite activities to facilitate there is um, a sound map where I have them like just sit quietly for like two minutes and, and document the, the sounds that they hear. And, and they actually, you know, they'll, They'll write down uh, birds and trains and cars and wind. So we get to talking about um, urban forests and why they're why they're important and why we should um, preserve and protect them. And the next one. 
So similar to Simpson Park, 80 Barnes Park is um, also mostly outdoors and um, we're talking about the natural areas. Um, 80 Barnes Park is located just off of Bird Road in Westchester. Now, unlike most of the other sites, this is the one site that the majority of students, because we always ask how many of you have been here before, this one is familiar to them, but not a lot of them have been to the sort of back end of this park, which is home to this little, um, a, you know, small nature preserve. It's home to uh, Pine Rockland endangered native habitat. Um, so it's, it's still, there is still something new for them to explore here. This park was, um, wait, go back, was, <laughs> was named after the parks, the county parks first um, parks director. Um, but more importantly, we, we focus on the, the habitat and its connection to early Miami history. So how these plants were utilized by Native Americans or by early um, pioneers. You know, I noticed that someone in the chat a while ago asked if our house was made of pine. And that's because a lot, yeah, a lot of old homes at the time were made out of this um, Dade County pine or South Florida slash pine as it's known. So we try to make that connection. And the next one, this is um, our building, which Chris already talked about, the historic office of Dr. Jackson, where, where we are right now. And it was built in 1905. We have two exhibits, two permanent exhibits located inside, the, inside this building. One of them is just about Miami medicine, like the early history of medicine here in Miami and a little bit of doctor about Dr. Jackson. And then the other exhibit, which is where Chris is sitting right now, is uh, all about Biscayne Bay. It's called Biscayne Bay, Our Water, Our World. Yeah. It's a little little tour. Oh, I'm gonna go over to the to the Coral City camera. Oh yeah. Um so this exhibit it's so pretty. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Coral City camera, this is a live underwater camera. I believe it's located near the port of Miami. And <laughs> look at them. It's so mesmerizing to, to watch it. You could just watch it all day. Yeah. Um, the camera will like, you know, it'll shift throughout the day so that you can see something different. And if you're lucky, you might see a manatee or, um, all kinds of, of critters. They have an Instagram where they post like the highlights of the day. Um, but anyway, this exhibit, it sort of tells a little bit about the story of like early settlement along the bay. Oh yeah. And, but it mostly goes into the challenges that Biscayne Bay faces today, which are a lot. There is a little bit of, you know, we have a wall that's about like solutions for the bay, for like a healthier bay. Um, but, you know, we, because of our close proximity to the bay, where, where we are right now in, in Brickell, we felt that it was necessary to, to have an exhibit about Biscayne Bay. Um, and so for our educational program, we collaborated with Miami Water Keepers to develop this uh, water quality activity where students could actually walk across the street and, and we collect a little sample of water and using these water monitoring kits, we can sort of um, measure the, the health of the, of the water. And it's really fun for them because it's hands-on and um, makes them feel like scientists. And um, wait, go back. Okay, so um, in addition to those single visit field trips, um, we have this other program called Miami Urban Tree Trekkers. And this program was kind of born out of the Miami Canopy Coalition that Chris talked about earlier. 
And the idea is to um, promote urban forests in Miami and why they're why it's important to preserve native habitats, um, including the pine rocklands, the mangroves, coastal hammocks, and Biscayne Bay. So this program, it's a little bit more immersive than our other offerings. So like it starts with a classroom visit, followed by a visit to Simpson Park, 80 Barnes, and then the real special one is we take them to Virginia Key Beach, North Point Park, um, which is near the historic beach, but north of it. Um, and so you can see a picture of, of kids using those same water quality um, kits. Really cute little picture. And those are the nature journals that they use to document their experience at every park. Yeah, I mean, Lucia does a, a beautiful job with this program, and I can tell you we're, we're so proud of it. Um, Miami-Dade County Public Schools actually designated us as an official STEAM partner, science, technology, environment, arts, and math because of the many facets of the program. And it's been so well received that um, we have a lot of foundations that, that, um, that fund this. We're, we're able to provide free transportation um, for Title I schools. So I, I can tell you when, when Lucia presents these programs and then we'll do, you know, we'll do an after, after program discussion that it's amazing that uh, many of these kids, this is their first interaction um, with the Bay. This is as close as they've ever been to Biscayne Bay or, and they're the first time they've ever, like she stated, walked in a forest. So just that alone, I will tell you is so satisfying. Um, but then being able to educate them about the importance of preserving these places, which is what we're all about, makes it is the icing on the cake. Yeah, it's it's great to, that we, you know, as a grant funded program, we can provide this program at no cost to to students. And just to clarify, you know, Title One schools are schools with primarily lower income students. So the, that's the majority of, of students that, that we get that participate. And um, well, this past year, as many of us have done, um, all of our programs had to be conducted virtually and it was actually surprisingly very popular. Um, we conducted more than a hundred virtual tours and luckily all of these four sites um, Simpson Park, 80 Barnes here, and Lummis Park had pretty good signal. So we were able to do everything live. You know, the kids could, could interrupt us and ask questions. We adapted some of the activities um, to be, um, to work virtually. And um, we'll be offering hopefully in person beginning uh, in the fall, but we're, we're also gonna keep this option open of, of virtual tours. And one other thing that I wanted to, to mention, you know, developing partnerships with the city, the county, and other nonprofit organizations is really important for us and for the education program. So like, you know, through grant funding, we're able to help these sites restore or develop new signage that not only serves our program, but also the site in general. Um, and so, well, I had one other thing because we're constantly like adding new programs to the mix. Chris is constantly just throwing more places at me. <laughs> Sorry. But I'm really, really excited about this one. This is Arch Creek Park in North Miami. And we'll begin programming there in October. We've got a lot of fun activities planned for kids. And well, what makes this park historically significant is that um, in the 70s, they archaeologists found a bunch of artifacts there that would um, that suggest that the an ancient American Native American tribe, the Tequestas, utilized this site as like you know a, a, a place to to live. So a lot of the artifacts collected are actually stored in their in their museum, 
which is right there. And Kelly, you might have a heart attack if you go in there because I know that some of the artifacts are not, like three of the artifacts are not protected behind glass. So they're just like, people can just touch them. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Don't, you know? don't touch them. If you go there, I'm, I'm speaking. I know it's supposed to be don't only touch. like, <laughs> only like, you know, the parks person is supposed to touch them. But uh, yeah. I just thought that was funny. And you can see artifacts along the trail too, which is crazy. Maybe I should oh, just like that. sitting there. Well, because it's, you know, the, what they're, what they found there for the most part were like, um, seashells like things that would have come from the bay because you know arch creek um was like a tributary that led to the bay so the tequestas would um you know they'd kind of come and go from from biscayne bay to the higher uh, ground of the tropical hardwood hammock where they would settle and so you know a lot of the tools that they would make and a lot of the things that they would eat came from these like you know like conch shells and things like that so you find that here they're just sort of coming up from the soil like oh certain, wow certain trees that have fallen over you can see the artifacts like like these seashells kind of wrapped in in roots oh wow trees. that's so interesting and it's really cool um, so I'm really excited to, to start programming there. And, you know, if you want to learn more about what we're doing and the different um, educational programs that we offer, you can visit our website, dateheritagetrust.org. And we've got all the information there about everything that I talked about and that Chris talked about. Um, and you can reach out to us there as well. And I just want to say thank you to Vizcaya for putting this together. Yes. Thank you for you guys. Thank you guys. It's our pleasure. So it's actually time for our Q&A section. So if oh. you have any questions that you haven't put in to the comments, please go ahead and do that now. I'm just going to scroll through real quick. Um, and I will say that most of the things that are that are in the comments are not questions, but it's tons of praise and positive things like that you know this person loves the art deco building that was first shown is in Chris's section of the presentation this person says congratulations on all the important work that you do particularly at EHT um I'm gonna show some more the sky lover over here which is always nice to see <laughs> um oh uh this one came up during the marine Gar uh sorry the marine stadium presentation yeah, yeah, everybody a has there. a concert story from that's what I that's what I learned when we were working on the the Marine Stadium. Everyone has has a story from there. Yes, absolutely. Ooh, we have a question. Um, Charlotte asked, uh, "What conservation challenges do you have at Viscaya Kelly?" That's yours. That's a so, big question. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say that. So many. That's yeah. That's that's a really big question. Maybe um, just a handful. So Vizcaya has all of the normal, normal problems of a, you know, 100 plus year old building, um, but then add into the mix the proximity to the water and hurricanes and climate change, um, climate change in general. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the fact that things are getting hotter, um, you know the weather events and the way that they are ramping up, it also affects the deterioration of a lot of these um, surfaces as well and accelerates their deterioration as well. And so, you know, we have to have a lot of conversations about what do we do? Um, what can we do? What's appropriate to do? Um, you know, uh, for example, on the barge, there's um, right now the center island of the barge is is underwater uh, during just a regular high tide. Yeah, I remember it would go like up and down. Sometimes it would for days it would just be covered in water. Yeah, and and there are actually steps underwater that you never even see anymore that would have been visible 
before, and that's just part of the rising seas. And so, you know, we, we're having conversations about how do we protect that portion of the barge as the water rises up. And so that's, you know, a challenge that we're facing. And, um, you know. You know, I would think just, I mean, you're, you're doing the conservation work itself, right? So hands on, but just the planning and how you prioritize. And then of course, the big one is funding, right? I mean, so all these wish lists and yeah. where, what's the priority and then seeking the funding to do all of that work. Um, yeah, Chris is advocating amazing. to donate. <laughs> I am. I am. <laughs> Um, so that's yeah. actually a, a perfect opportunity to drop in where you can do that stuff. So we are going to put on, on the screen Dade Heritage website. You can become a member and also check up check out their upcoming events. Um, and of course, you can also visit the Skya if you want to see all of Kelly's handiwork up close and personal. Um, so thank you so much to everybody for being here on the live stream. Thank you to Chris and Lucia and Kelly. Thank and to you. all of you that joined us live, and we'll see you on the next one. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.